India's largest winemaker, Sula Vineyards, filed its IPO DRHP recently. Sula Vineyards reported a strong uh, third quarter update. It's a 13% jump in their overall revenues year on year. Drinking wine is now trendy in India, especially wine produced in what could be called India's own Napa Valley. Nashik. Sula Wine, India's largest wine maker, isn't just producing wine, but also creating a market for its product. We have a fantastic journey ahead. Uh, Sula is the leader in that. India is changing so fast. Wine has terrific prospects here. Hi everybody, Sula Wines is one of the most incredible companies in the Indian business ecosystem and they've established such an insane dominance in the wine industry of India that while Frateli Wines has a total land acreage of 240 acres, Grover Zampa has 460 acres but Sula alone has an acreage of 2600 acres which is more than its next three competitors combined. And what's even more mind-blowing is that in spite of having 5 to 10 times more cultivation, while Frateli had an average inventory time of 595 days, Grover stood at 878 days, whereas Sula had an average inventory time of just 465 days. Which means, in spite of Sula producing 5 times more wine, it was able to push its products at a way faster pace than its competitors. And Sula has been such a dominating player in India that even the biggest winemakers in the world have not been successful in India. As a result, Sula today stands as the king in the Indian wine industry with a market share of 53%. So in this episode of the underrated Indian Business Maharaja series, let's try to understand how did Sula Wines go from being a humble startup to becoming the king of the Indian wine market? What were the business strategies that helped them get so far ahead of their competition? And most importantly, as students of business, what are the lessons and study materials to help you understand Sula and the Indian wine industry? This is a story that dates back to 1990s Maharashtra. This is when Raji Samant was working with Oracle in California and back home his father owned a small 20 acre farm in Nashik in Maharashtra. And if you know, California has some of the biggest wineries in the world and it is literally the fourth largest winemaker in the world that generates a revenue of $114 billion every single year. And California alone produces 81% of the wine made in the United States of America. Now, the reason why California is so, so perfect for wineries is that it has the best suited climate for grapevine production, which are warm days, cold nights, healthy rainfall, a nutrient-rich soil, and more importantly, a free draining soil. This makes it an ideal combination for allowing wine grapes to ripen slowly and evenly. And guess what? By looking at the climatic condition of California, Rajiv realized that just like Napa Valley, even the Dindori Hills in Nashik had the exact same attributes. Warm days, cool nights, healthy rainfall, a nutrient-rich soil, and a free draining soil. So after working at his friend's winery for three months, Rajiv returned to India, planted his first wine grapes in 1995, and started his quest to make the best wine India had ever seen. Now most people will be like, yeah bro, so what? He was a rich dude from California, had lands in Nashik, so he grew grapes, made wine, and started selling them. So what exactly is the big deal in this? Well, even I thought so. But when I looked deeper into how difficult the wine business is, it blew my mind. Did you know that if you decide to grow wine grape in your farm today, it will take you at least four to six years just to push out your first bottle of wine into the market. Why? Because preparing a wine grape farm is an extremely tiresome process. First of all, the soil should be tested to determine the pH level and nutrient contents. And if it has the right level of pH and the essential nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, you can go ahead with the cultivation. But if it doesn't, then the land needs to be amended with fertilizers to achieve the perfect condition for wine grapes. And then, if the land has not been previously used for grape cultivation, it needs to be tilled and graded to create the proper drainage and slow for the wine grapes. And this process again takes several weeks to a few months. And it's only after this tedious procedure that the wine grape can be planted. After that, it will take another 2-3 to three years for the wine grapes to start producing fruit and then after 3-5 to five years, they can be harvested for wine making. This is the start of the wine making process. After that, there is the process of fermentation, blending, aging, stabilizing, filtration and then finally, the wine is bottled, labelled and sold in the market. This is the reason why, even though Sula planted its first wine grapes in 1995, the first bottle of wine was actually sold in 2000. Now, the question over here is, 
this was the case with all the winemakers, right? Then how on earth did Sula become a market leader in wines and get an edge over other competitors? Well, the first thing that helped Sula grow was the government policy of Maharashtra in 2001, which was something called the Maharashtra Grape Processing Policy. In simple words, before 2001, it was extremely difficult for you to get approvals to start a wine company. And even if you started one, you had to get your approvals for the plot, electricity supply and other infrastructure needed for a winery. Secondly, the excess duty on old wine industries was at 100% of the production expenditure. Which means, even if it costs you 1000 rupees to make a bottle of wine, the excess duty on it will be another 1000 rupees. So this clearly made it extremely difficult for the winemakers to enter the Indian markets. But after this policy came out, the excise duty on old wine industries was reduced from 100% to just 50% of the production expenditure. And for new wine industries, it was reduced to just 25% of the production expenditure. On top of that, a single window clearance system was established for essential licenses, plot, electricity supply, telephones, etc. On top of that, the government also made financing easier for the wine companies. So you see, licensing was made easier, financing was made easier and the barrier to entry due to taxes was reduced. This is what caused a huge increase in the annual production of wine in the entire state of Maharashtra, whereby wine production shot up to 20 million litres by 2008. Secondly, by looking at the massive growth of Maharashtra, even Karnataka came up with its Karnataka wine policy. And just like Maharashtra, Karnataka reduced the time period it takes for licensing to under 30 days. And this gave its local wineries a boost. On top of that, they also increased the excise duty on wine made outside Karnataka from just 10 rupees a litre to 300 rupees a litre. And cherry on the cake, even the Indian government made excise duty on import wines to be 150%. So even foreign wines could not enter India. So clearly, the market was made conducive not just for Sula, but for all winemakers in India. So the question over here is, this government policy benefit was for all wineries in India, right? Then what did Sula do special because of which today it stands as a market leader with a 52% market share? Well, until 2008, Sula was just another winemaker. And this is when one of the worst episodes of world economy happened. 2008 was a tumultuous year for the economy. The housing market collapse created one financial crisis after another, and it often seemed as if the news could only get worse. The American financial system is rocked to its foundation as top Wall Street institutions topple under a mountain of debt. It was one of the most profound events in generations with huge consequences for the American economy. It led to an age of populism, a deep distrust of Wall Street, and a near meltdown of the global economy. Not in generations has Wall Street absorbed the number of body blows it took today. Now, back in 2008, in the Indian market, a company called Shato Indej had a massive 60% market share in India. But the problem was that they made some extremely risky bets because of which they incurred unsustainable losses in 2008. Eventually, the Bombay High Court ordered the company to liquidate its assets. Now, when this giant company shut down, the farmers who supplied wine grapes were completely left high and dry. Why? Because if you remember, growing wine grapes takes 3 to 5 years just to reach the productivity levels. So the farmers that grow these grapes sign a contract of 10 to 12 years with the wine companies so that there's a win-win situation. The wineries have a steady supply of grapes and the farmers can have a steady source of income. Secondly, they could not shift to another crop immediately because it would take another 1 to 2 years for them to clear their grape fields and then start another plantation. And thirdly, once they clear their grape fields, after one year, if there's another buyer in the market, it will take them another 4 years just to get back in the market. So the farmers were practically stuck in a deadlock. But guess what? This is where Sula came as a savior for these farmers and they quickly signed contracts at affordable prices such that Sula could get high quality grapes at low cost and the farmers get a steady flow of income. The second thing that Sula did is even more fascinating. Sula found out that the Indian wine audience is actually far different from the foreign wine audience. They noticed that while global wine drinkers were over the age of 45, in India, wine drinkers were relatively young. In fact, later a study stated that globally 65% of the wine drinkers are over the age of 45. Whereas in 2018, the Wine Intelligence Report found out over 50% of the Indian wine drinkers are actually millennials, as in people between the age group of 23 to 37. So clearly, Sula realized that they have to do something special that hooks the millennials and not the Gen X, as in our parents' generation. 
So you know what? During the 2008 crisis, while everybody was trying to save every penny they could, Sula made a huge investment into something called the Sula Fest. And this is what it looks like. Long story short, Sula Fest is a festival that is meant to give you an exhilarating experience of soothing music, camping under a sky full of stars, breathtaking sunrises, foot massages and most importantly, the most exquisite variety of Sula wines. And you will be stunned to know that Sula Fest has been a massive hit with a footfall of 10,000 people in 2020. And today, it is one of the largest wine festivals in Asia. And Sula Minyas today is not just a destination, but a resort that has become such a tourist sensation that Sula is the most visited vineyard in the country with 3.68 lakh people visiting in just FY20 itself. And this incredible strategy, ladies and gentlemen, gave Sula three major superpowers. Number one, Sula became an extremely popular brand among the millennials of India. And when many people visited these vineyards, as it turns out, most of them were doing wine tasting for the first time. So Sula not just became an important memory for them, but was also able to educate them about all the different types of wine they had and the different qualities of wine. So this way, they could help the first time wine tasters find the best suited choice for them. And cherry on the cake, if they came out with a new wine, they could easily market it to the tourists. And last and most importantly, as we all know, alcohol advertising is completely prohibited in India. So, while all Sula's competitors struggled to reach their customers, Sula was not just able to reach them, but was also able to impress them with its incredible collection of wines. And this is what gave Sula and still gives Sula a very, very big edge over its competitors. Now, the last question over here is, Sula obviously might be a leader in India, right? But what if an international giant like Treasury Wines or Diageo enters the Indian markets? In fact, they will be able to produce more varieties of wine and they'll be able to achieve better economies of scale than Sula, right? Then what did Sula do special that it is not being challenged by the international players at all? Well, this is where the biggest barrier to entry in the wine industry of India comes in. And if you understand them, you will realize that Sula is literally the Jaikan Shikre of the Indian wine industry. To tell you about it, firstly, the Indian government leverages a 150% import duty on foreign wine. So even if a European company tries to sell wine at 10 euros, which is 900 rupees, when a 150% import duty is applied, it would cost 2,250 rupees only because of the duty. Add this up with the cost of transportation and retail commissions and you will see that while the same quality of wine from Sula comes at 800 rupees, just because it's a foreign company, it will end up costing 2,500 rupees at the least. So obviously, the foreign wine companies will find it extremely difficult to penetrate the Indian wine market. And also guys, when you gift expensive foreign wines to somebody thinking that it will actually taste better, I got to tell you that more often than not, it's expensive not because it's better, but because of the taxes. And by the way, only Australian and UK wines can enter India with less duty because of India's free trade agreement. Secondly, if these foreign companies try to set up a company in India, the biggest problem they'll face is the sourcing of raw materials because 60 to 70% of the wine grape farmers belong to Sula alone. And thirdly, even if they catch hold of the land, it is very difficult for them to find a quality workforce. So the number of skilled winemakers in India is very, very limited. And last and most importantly, Sula has built such a vast and extensive supply chain that as of 2021, they supplied wine to 8,000 hotels, restaurants and caterers and are signing up deals with more than 13,000 retailers all across the world. This is how Sula has sealed its position as the indisputable king of the Indian wine industry. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last part of the episode and that are the business lessons that we need to learn from the rise of the wine king of India. Lesson number one, no matter how good your business is, you must always and always focus on building a powerful barrier to entry. In this case, Sula has built some extraordinary barriers with Sula Fest, its supply chain and 12-year farmer contracts. So tomorrow, even if a billionaire wants to start a wine business, he cannot build Sula Fest. He cannot catalyze the winemaking process beyond three years. And more importantly, he cannot acquire the contracted farmers. Similarly, even foreign companies are stuck with the excise duty barrier. So this makes Sula an extraordinary business. Lesson number two, understanding government policies can help you build a formidable business. 
In this case, Mr. Samant kept on expanding Sula wines with every favorable government policy, because of which today he is literally the wine king of India. And lastly, always remember, experience-based marketing is far more powerful than impression-based marketing. While most alcohol brands have used surrogate marketing, Sula has gone miles ahead and has established the Sula Fest to give their customers and first-time wine drinkers the most memorable and the most ecstatic experience of wine. So the Sula experience makes it far more powerful than just a fancy ad. As a result, Sula's perception will always be ahead of other brands. If this isn't an epitome of greatness, I don't know what is. That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.